and I am really not getting into it. I just don't really want to spend an awful lot of time explaining who and what, except to say that um, along with Simon Hackett, um, myself and Simon worked towards the development of the new M3. Thanks very much, everybody, for joining me today. Um, I think there's uh, there's quite a lot, I think, have registered. I think we've got about 150 odd have registered. So just to let you all know, because again, to give you some idea of how many people are tuning in, um, hopefully you can see my uh, PowerPoint on the, on the screen. What I, I want to do today, I mean, it's, it'll be impossible to try to cover everything in terms of what EM3 is, but what I'm, I'm going to hopefully try to do is before the tea break, um, I'm going to give you, those of you who don't know EM3, is to give you an insight into what led to the change um, and what the change is about and what the model is about um, and try to give you some sense of what led to that, I suppose for me, um, I'm hoping, um, hopefully, a bit of a, a guiding shift into the field of understanding harmful sexual behaviour. After the tea break, I'm then going to take a look at what we're calling this trauma lens. I mean, for me personally, I've been involved with NOTA now more years than I actually genuinely want to remember now at this stage. Um, and that's all very positive and that's very good. But I think for me, the abiding change for me has been how NOTA has moved from an offender, potentially more judicial, just, just, just a sort of background into, again, really striving to get a much more of an understanding from a trauma developmental impact around not only from the offender perspective, but also from the victim perspective. So I think the fact that, you know, during COVID, let's be honest, we can talk about all the negatives of it, but I think it has been a great opportunity to say, let's now look at being able to bring some of the, I suppose, developmental movements within the field um, to everybody. So I think this is a great opportunity for us to be able to take a look at um, harmful sex of behaviour through that trauma lens and right. using the M3. The outline of the uh, of the day will be as I'll, I'll do I'll this, yeah. an introduction into the M3. Uh, then we're going to have a coffee break, um, and then I'm going to talk a bit around the in terms of that trauma informed lens, and then we're going to have time then from quarter past eleven to half past eleven for questions. Um, if, however, at the same time you have a burning question, you absolutely fail, you know, ants in your pants and you can't hold on to it. And it's so exciting and you really, really, really need, be, need to ask me it. Do you know what? Look, unmute yourself and just ask me it. I don't really mind. Um, but if you want to hold them to the end, that's fine as well. That's no problem. But we also need to, I suppose I want to just bear in mind as well, is that um, by the very nature of just even having trauma in the heading, um, do you know what? Nobody has lived the perfect lifestyle and nobody has lived that perfect life. Um, and I think more and more we always need to be aware of that. So I think, again, sometimes if some of the discussions get a bit difficult, do you know what? This is the ideal thing about Zoom. You can switch off and I won't know and you do whatever you need to do. And do you know what? And you're allowed to take, um, I know it's early morning, but you know what? You can take two extra cups of coffee or three or four or whatever else you might need. That's absolutely fine too. But in other words, take care of yourself. I think when we're always talking about trauma stuff. Okay. Obviously, um, I'm, I'm the author, um, along with the brilliant um, Simon Hackett, um, in terms of, of, of writing this, but it's also its aim. And I suppose those of you, I mean, who don't know AIM, is there actually anybody who doesn't know AIM? But those of you who don't know AIM, AIM is very much grounded um, in terms of being established for practitioners. Um, by practitioners. And I think that's one of the, the important things is that those of us that are working with NEM, we try to provide a quality effective assessment intervention models right across all practitioners working in a variety of Marcella, you've muted. Marcella, you've muted. We can't hear you. I don't know if you can hear us.
Oh no. <clears throat> Okay, can you hear me back now? Yes. Yes, yes. okay. And can you get my screen again? Can you get Miss? can you see my screen or do yeah. I need to share my screen? I can't I can't see the screen. Can't see the screen. Okay, that's all right. We're just gonna do, go over and do it again. Okay. All right. Um I think what had happened was that they maybe went off and realized they hadn't handed over co-host to me. <laughs> <laughs> which is absolutely fine. Uh, wait a wee minute here. That's, it's all right. It's not a problem. Um, just give me one second. I'll, I'm still with you. So don't worry about it. I'm here. Um, okay. All right. Can you see what well, I just want to now check? You just need to let me know. What can you see in the screen at the moment? No, nothing else. What see do you mean? everyone's faces everything faces that's that's fine just 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 means you just need to let me know so then i can work through what's happened here um okay um <clears throat> okay i'm on share screen um, um that's okay I think they maybe opted out, you see, and then that's what happens. They maybe just didn't pass that over to me, which is fine. Um, Saying your camera's off now. <clears throat> um, okay, wait a wee minute. Really, really important during all of this, you don't panic. Because it's not... It's, <laughs> not, <laughs> it's absolutely not, not a trauma, so that's all right. Um, Okay, can yeah. you see a screen? Yeah. Now? Yes. All right. All yeah. right. And you're seeing lots of different ones, but you can see it. We're back yeah. in business. Yes. We're back in business. Yeah. Are we all all right? And everybody can see it okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. That's no problem. Okay. All right. So let me get started again, uh, not at the very start, but we're going to go back to where it's in that the importance being is in terms of having developed this model. This model for me um, was around the AIM journey, obviously began 2001 and we looked at the AIM initial assessment and obviously we updated 2012 and we took through then a review in terms of 2018. Um, never again, um, whatever anybody, somebody says to me to update um, a model, an update to me is a couple of pages. Um, as you can, those of you who have seen the M3, it was a complete um, rewrite. And I think the reason for that was because Simon and I use this as an opportunity to, I suppose, inform what we felt was really important in terms of beginning to look at like, um, I suppose, understanding what was AM2. We took AM2 feedback from the practitioners, from trainers, from the agency, but we also considered the change in nature of harmful sexual behavior in today's society. So for example, things like, you know, how change in nature in terms of technology. But we also were very, very clear as well, albeit that AM2, had 72 factors within it. What we didn't feel, it didn't enable the practitioner in, a, in an easy format to try to gain, a, I suppose, a developmentally informed sense of what's going on for this young person. Because what still tended to happen, even though that was not how the M2 model was designed, but it still fitted within the static labeling of a young person as low, medium and high. As somebody who comes from, I have always worked in this field, but from a health perspective. My background is as a social worker, but based in mental health. I don't see harmful sexual behavior or indeed even adult sexual offending ever only sitting within criminal justice. So if you come from a health perspective, for me to provide anybody with a labeling of low, medium and high doesn't actually cognitively make sense to me. And it was one of the things that we were very clear of, how do we move people beyond the, the comfort zone, which it provides to professionals of being able to give somebody a label of low, medium and high, because then that means we know what resources we have to do. We know this and we know that, but actually it does nothing for the young person. What we wanted to be able to do was come up with a model that provided input to give an insight into this young person, not a, a, de a determination of a category of risk, but actually what happened to you, what has informed you, what is your pathway, what do we need to do to try to get you back 
onto the, onto a pathway of understanding of having your sexual needs met in a safe way. So the core principles of the AIM-3 were to seek to understand the harmful sexual behaviour within the wider function and experiences of that young person. Often what tends to happen, as we all know, we will end up completing risk assessment reports and whether that's including AIM-2 and or any other um, assessment model, but people flick to the last page and they flick to the last page in the last paragraph and what they want to see is, all right, so what risk is it? And they want to know, is that young person low, medium or high? And they just want to say, all right, so what's the recommendations? And those recommendations do not take into consideration as far as I was concerned and as far as Simon was concerned in terms of developmentally what's right for this person at this time in their life. There was no sense of sequencing as to when do we pre present this um, at the right time. So what, what bit do we do first? We, we tended to do, we tended to see lists of recommendations for young people that provided no guidance to practitioners, provided no guidance to young person, no guidance to their family as to, so what's the first thing we need to do? What do we need to do in order to give you the foundation in order for you to be able to address this really, really difficult part of your life? So it's about analysing the profile of a young person and how could we, we wanted something that we worked hard about trying to develop something that provided a profile of the young person as opposed to, to a determination of funneling down into a one, one statement. So again, in that profile for specific um, areas of, of what it, they're needed to remain safe, but also for interventions, but also what we wanted to do as well is stop this process that we put young people into, which means, and what I mean by that is, is how often we spend months and months and months and months assessing young people. And then we run out of time actually to do interventions because maybe suddenly they've reached 17 or 18 and the service that they're attending um, as a cutoff age of 18. And that means all we've ever actually done is we've just assessed that young person. But also, if that assessment process has not been delivered as an intervention, in other words, see an assessment in itself as an intervention, then that young person is always left with a determination of a, of a category of risk. So what we have designed, designed has been a model that allows for an assessment of a young person in no more than a six week period of time. And I'm stretching six weeks. I don't think anybody should be even taken any, anywhere even near that six weeks period of time. And then get straight into, so what does this young person need now? So very much building it as a, an, a review profile, a, an ongoing assessment intervention led model of assessment and intervention in terms of being able to work with this young person. Also, M3 is gender neutral. And um, it is also completely applicable for any person in relation to their race, to their culture, to their gender, and to their um, intellectual ability. So it can be used with any young person aged from between that age of 13 right up to 18. And that was really important for us because what I wanted to be able to do in the, the design of this model was to be able to assist practitioners in funneling down. I mean, I'm, I'm funneling is one of the things I strongly whenever I'm training in assessment is that I no assessment has met a need for a young person. If by the end of it, you can't assist that young person and their family and whoever is around them to understand who does that young person pose a risk to? When is that more likely? And what can we do to reduce the likelihood of that risk from happening? Assessments need to funnel that down. What tends to happen is we go wide at the start, they pose a risk to everybody. But then that's it. That there's so despite us putting sometimes our young people through um, months and months of assessments, there's no the funneling and down of that. So the model is designed to funnel that down. I don't need, and there shouldn't be anybody on here where I need to be telling you what is harmful sexual behaviour. But what I am wanting you to put up at, uh, uh, want you to look at in this slide is is that bit of where you know Simon is saying it's about moving away from that euphemistic or jargon ridden phrases. And it was really about the design of the EM3 model is its simplicity. But in its simplicity, what I feel um, we have been able to design is being able to take a model, take some factors that those factors um, can be looked at layered upon layered upon layered, depending on your professional experience, your professional background, your pr professional sort of, um, I suppose, the resource that you have to play with to be able to take each one of those at different layers, depending on the ex 
the resources you have, but also your own professional abilities. Obviously, what we're doing is what we're working through with Simon's Continuum in terms of obviously we're saying that the model works for those people where you're working from problematic right up in terms of from abusive. There shouldn't be a young person obviously coming within our remit who you are working, who has who's actually engaged in, in normal sexual behaviour. But also those young people who in terms of where it is, it's about inappropriate. What we're wanting those is to be absolutely named and identified and received good psychosexual education and, and good education and good sex education, but that hopefully they don't necessarily require the full M3. We have considered gender, we have considered age, we've considered ethnicity, we've considered attachment histories, um, learning disability, trauma histories and developmental, because we felt that at the time, we don't feel there is another assessment model within adolescent and work within HSB that I suppose enables practitioners in a, in a, in a more comprehensive 360 way in really taking apart with this young person what has gone on for them and really separating out each, uh, each aspect of their life. So what we have designed are the EM3 domains, and there are five domains. So one, the first domain here in terms of the sexual behavior, everything is also color-coded, and the books are all color-coded, and the model is entirely color-coded. And that's also bearing in mind, again, in terms of learning, people's learning styles, how people best learn, and how we as adults best learn. My style of working, um, just to say to you, it's not necessarily that I'm saying it's everybody's style of working, but it's my style of working. When I'm undertaking an EM3 assessment with a young person, after I complete and take all sort of the interviews and the histories and getting to know them and all of that, once I feel I've received enough of the information to get to the stage where I'm um, ready to, I think, go through each one of the factors in the scoring, is I sit with the young person and I let them score themselves. And one of the things the young people are feeding back to me is for them, actually they love the color coding because they think that makes a lot of sense for them. It picks up on any of those young people where actually they learn by it, they learn much more, being more adapt in terms of picking up that. The, the, the model is less threatening for them. It doesn't feel like they're being um, assessed as such in terms of they feel it's something they can work their way through. Um, so this is, I have used this model with young people 13 right up to till 18 and some young people who have been 19 where they've just been reached 19 years of age and those are some young people who have committed the full ranges of the lesser end of the spectrum right up to the most serious end in terms of of a uh, very serious um which receive custodial sentences for but all of them have found sitting down with me, working through a manual and a, not, a, not a manual, but a book in a format that allows them to understand the language within it, for them to understand what it's saying to them and for them to understand where they fit within this model. That to me has probably been one of the best things in relation to the development of this. So we've got five domains. We look at the sexual behavior. We look at non-sexual behavior. We look at the developmental aspect of the young person. We look at their environmental and family and we look at their self-regulation. When I'm teaching the model, um, I tend to say that domains one and two are the sexual behavior and the non-sexual behaviors are what are the behaviors? So what has this young person done? So what, what are those? What, what, let's name them for what they are. Because I think one of the things as well within the field of HSB is, do you know what? Let's name it. Because often these young people are coming to me when maybe their behaviours have not actually been named prepubescently. So one of the things I'm very clear on is name the behaviour, but then let's now put it to the side. But I am naming it. I'm naming it for what it is. So domains one and two, which are the sexual behaviours and the non-sexual behaviour, are very much what are the behaviours? What is this young person doing? How, what behaviours are they showing, um, both sexually and non-sexually? Domain three. Um, is then the developmental in terms of how are they, how have they developed, what has been their developmental pathway and what, how, how, what and who has affected them, what, what has gone on, what has informed their life. Domain four is then obviously looking at environmental and family um, and what role that has had to play within this young person coming to our attention today. And domain five then is the how, how are they? How are they in terms of how do they normally manage? How do they normally cope with things? So if you could maybe see domain, um, AM3 domains, please, as domains one and two as what's, domains three and four is why, and domain five is how. 
Okay, so what are the behaviors you've done? Why do I think you've done those behaviors? And how are you and how do you normally cope with those? In the model of the assessment, you end up with this. And this is probably has been probably one of the most significant changes in terms of doing HSB assessment is that what we wanted to develop, and Simon and I were very clear, we wanted something that was visually, visually understandable for a young person, but also moved us away from a one sentence which said, you pose this risk. I am one of my first, in terms of piloting this with, with families and with young people, I remember I, with, a, with a, um, a mother and her son on the old AM2 um, and indeed in a lot of the other adolescent assessment models would have been coming out as high risk. They would have been sitting in that high risk. However, when I showed her this model and she was very clearly saying to me, so he's not all bad. And you know what? That was that sentence in its own right to that young person who was sitting in the room as well, to be able to allow the mother to actually sit back and breathe and go, my son is not all bad, as opposed to previous reports all being about high, high, high risk. When she was trying to have her voice heard of, do you know what, there's something's really good and, he's, and he, he isn't all bad and is he really high risk all the time but, it, but he does this and he's very helpful about that and he's had a very difficult background and do you know he, he doesn't get into trouble all the time with the police, he doesn't do this but all she kept hearing was high risk. This is what this is about now, it's about really beginning to I suppose recognise this is about a developmentally, a developmentally informed model, a model that enables us to be able to sit with that young person and go, do you know what, I am worried about what you did sexually, I am very concerned about that and that sits within that red area and I'm very worried and very concerned about that but what I do know is that from a non-sexual perspective is that you know how to behave you don't break the rules all the time. You're not antisocial. You know the difference between right and wrong. But what I also know, if that's the case, high likelihood is you're going to engage with me in terms of understanding why did you commit the harmful sexual behavior that you did. But I also know from looking at this is that you have had some concerns in relation to developmentally. There are some you know, adversities and um experiences you have had in your life that I feel have had something to play with how come you've committed this HSB. But I also know the environment in which you're living in and that family background has also got a part to play within that, that we need to take a look at. But I also know at the moment is that for you to be able to regulate yourself is very difficult. You struggle with that. You struggle to self-regulate. You struggle to try to manage things yourself. And you know what? It is extremely unfair of us to put in recommendations and put in sort of these are the things you have to do when this graph is already telling me on a day-to-day -day basis you're struggling. So what we need to be able to do is make sure that I can take you and take some of these areas down from that domains three, four, and five, get those areas down into low amber, into green if we can, to provide you with a foundation in order to keep you safe, to be able to then look at what has gone on in terms of the HSB. So it's about being able to give the young person a direction, a young person and their family insight into, this is not just about what they did with either their hands or their genitalia or whatever, but it's wider than that. And it all has a role to play in understanding why this young person has committed a HSB. So the graph is designed by, firstly, is that we have the five domains. In each of the five domains, in each of the domains, we have factors, five factors. And what we have given you in each of the five factors is items as aid memoirs to help you understand to begin to think and analyze why this young person might have done this, to be able to then eventually come up with a profile graph of this young person. And that's the important thing. The important thing is about recognizing there is no language of low, medium and high. Now, if you want, um, if you want to be able to say, well, red replicates the, the high and green the low, that's fine, but what I would say to you, I will be extremely angry, cross, upset, frustrated, and believe me, that's not a pleasant experience to have. If I ever saw 
the words low, medium and high being referred to in any HSB assessment where the AIM-3 model has been used because it fundamentally goes against the principles of this model. It is to move away from these categorizations because it has no place in terms of moving forward. What we have looked at in terms of looking at the domains, we've looked at these five factors in each of these domains, which I'm going to talk a bit more in once we get to after the tea break, around understanding, you know, the sexual behaviour, you know, what the young person did, their non-sexual behaviour developmental. In terms of trying to gain some insight into separating out each one of them, so each domain in its own right is scored, each domain in its own right is analysed, each domain in its own right is considered. However, in through developmentally informed models of working, and whether you want to say that's through the trauma-informed lens or whether you want to take that from an, uh, an, you know, an ACES-informed lens or whether you want to call it from a holistic lens, I genuinely don't really mind what you want to do with that. What I'm asking you to do is take a look at it from a biopsychosocial lens. In other words, what I want you to consider is here is beginning to look at biologically, why is this young person? So what's going on for them physically in their development and their cognitive development, understanding it psychologically, what has happened to this young person and psychologically where they're at, but also then socially, where is this young person at? So it's a biopsychosocial approach in terms of understanding and gathering a 360 understanding of the young person and the HSB, therefore, within that 360 view of this of them. But it also the idea of the graph is to help that young person see that's where we need to target. The idea of the model is that you undertake the assessment with the young person and their family and bring together all of those people who know this young person. So that, you know, school, medical, everybody else who, who knows this young person, sports, any interests that they have to gain as much information as possible. But what's critical in this, it's not just about gaining information, but it's about seeking to understand that information through the lens of that young person. What is this telling me about this young person? What it is also saying to you as well is, let's look at how we now intervene. Because the key thing about this is not about saying, right, we're going to tackle. How could you tackle the HSB if we already know that the environment to which I'm sending them home after I would do some sessions is actually quite unstable? That's not safe for them. It's not safe for the young people. And it's not safe for potentially any other victims who may get harmed. So it provides a guide in terms of what do we do? What do we intervene in? When do we intervene? When is the right, what is the right thing to intervene with at this time? But not losing sight of the absolutely critical importance of building the relationship with this young person. Security and a sense of attachment is built on your ability and the experience of having a relationship, the ability to relate to others and others to relate to you. Recognizing that this is a very difficult topic for young people the last thing we need is if we're giving categorizations of low, medium and high to a young person, you know as well as I do, that high would mean things like building relationships automatically get superseded by things like risk, risk management plans, protection, all of those things that how do you do that while maintaining that relationship with that young person? The idea of the graph is to separate this all out and begin to think about we need to make this young person feel safe first. So you've got your domains and the factors. Each one are scored. Um, I would have to say if, if Simon was joining us today, he was. we both debated of we didn't really want to get into a scoring system, but we recognise for practitioners um, that actually scoring provides them with a structure. But it also then was able to lead to the development of a profile graph of the young person. So the way it is scored is that four will be is that you are very concerned about this issue that you have a significant concern about it too, is that you have some concern. And a zero is that, you know, I have no general concern about this factor. And in fact, it may be a strength. Previously, AIM2 was, was um, divided into strengths and concerns. And personally, one of my greatest concerns I had was that who am I 
um, and I genuinely mean this, is that who am I to decide that for every young person that I assess, I must say that that's a concern. Equally, that for every young person I assess, I have to say that that's a strength. That's a not an individualized bespoke approach to a young person, because for some young people, what are strengths, unfortunately, are concerns for another young person, depending on how they have used that in their relationships and to be able to cause harm to other people. So what we have done is we have de developed and identified all of the factors that we're saying that you must consider. And it is you as practitioners that need to determine, are you worried about this for this young person or are you not? And if you're not worried, is this for this young person a strength? So therefore it has really made it a unique individualized bespoke assessment and that no nobody can come out. I think um, one of the abiding things I think I have is that, you know, when you come out with a medium um, and I'm going to actually um, uh, um, um, attribute this comment to the great uh, Clark Bain who I know was on uh, and Clark, even if I didn't know you were on, I would have attributed it to you anyway, is that it's a bit like in medium where I remember him once saying to me is what is medium it's a bit like a medium steak is it medium rare is it medium well done is it just medium medium what does that actually mean but yet how often as practitioners we would have had this language um of well he's a medium risk and we're all walking around going yeah he's a medium risk and expecting families to understand that the young person to understand that but do you know what that doesn't mean anything and we need to, to move on beyond that and I think for me there's something about hopefully you seeing that we have moved on beyond that and that's what the model's about. So scores of not to four are those things which are indicating a relative strength within that young person's life so really again it's forcing you as practitioners as well to go do you know what if you're not worried about it then name it because sometimes when we're caught up in other assessments, we nearly struggle to give the positives because of maybe we're stuck within the harm that they've done. I'm very clear when I'm training on this is absolutely name the behaviours. I have no issue with that. Name them, name them fully and name them for what they are. But once you've done that, look to the side and objectively, and I mean that objectively, go into the other domains and go, right, now let's start from scratch now again. Let's look at what that actually means. So a not to four is you may not, um, it's an area of relative strength. Six to 12 are those areas where we need to lower the risk. We've got to work on these areas, but they are what requires intervention in the medium term. And 14 to 20 are those areas which require immediate attention in relation to safeguarding, in relation to external you know, risk management, but that they are clearly the areas where we're saying is you need to address these areas immediately. However, if that's the sexual abuse area, that does not mean by intervening and trying to do sessional work on some very difficult areas. But it's about looking across to the fifth domain of self-regulation. If that's also in red, that's telling you the young person can't manage themselves. If also, sadly, environment and family sitting in red, the family can't manage it either. Those three areas will tell you we need to do something external. However, as I had in a graph the other day with a young person, I had a red in the first domain, which is absolutely the HSB they've committed is serious. But I had green in self-regulation and I had green in family, which meant that family and that young person could manage this. He has committed a very serious HSB but it does tell me they're able to manage it. So let's build that strength and let's support that strength to be able to do that. But that enables me as a practitioner to feel comfortable with the decision making that I'm doing. The model is designed that you work in terms of you carry out your aim three. It will tell you what intervention you need to do. And can I please ask you to consider an intervention is any input that you do and you know what that intervention is as simple as just consistently being there for that young person trying to maybe getting them back into school about trying to be able to be able to sort of work with them to engage with them to build that relationship one of the biggest challenges that we've had with young people is whenever they've committed a hsb is that immediate response to remove that young person from school because again not funneling down 
What I have found working with my education colleagues is being able to provide a profile graph, which basically can tell them, do you know what? Absolutely, that HSB is concerned. But what we know is it has been limited to the family environment. It has been limited to that. From an environmental point of view, his removal from school pushes him into that red area. We need to get him back in order to work that down. And they have been able to understand where they fit within that field. Because up until now, we have been asking schools to understand the language of low, medium and high. No school would be able to sit comfortably with being told this person presents a medium risk. It doesn't say, do they present a medium risk in your school? So what I have found is that schools have worked really well with the graph to understand where do they fit within that and for them to make the decisions that they need to make from a, a wider population of young people whom they need to protect. So it is done on an aim, you know, you carry it to aim three, you then do your interventions, working on the graph, keep an eye on the graph. You repeat the aim three graph. You see what way, what is your intervention done? Because again, this is this bit about having a model that I suppose holds us as practitioners to account in terms of, as I've intervened in this family, maybe areas that were green have now shot up to amber and the reason for that being is I've created more fear more anxiety maybe that family were were coping in some way but now the reality has hit so it lets us keep a dynamic awareness of what's going on within that family system and that we then proactively intervene in a much more positive way to try to address the changes in the graphs so you constantly keep the graph for supervisors it provides a very clear structure in terms of supervision for that for that case and keeping that case on track because the one thing is what i don't like is where cases go on and on and on and what we're getting then maybe in a six month review or a three month review that there's been no movement why have i waited for three months to hear that there's been no movement what's going on i have sat with young people and i've said there's no movement in this graph things aren't happening so i know you're turning up to my sessions i, I know that so it's really about addressing you know, are you really working with it and what's blocking those changes to be able to happen? So what tends to happen with the structure, therefore with your name three, is that you, you, you look at your domain explanation, we've got a list of factors, we have a rationale for each factor, and we give you items to help you sort of in terms of assessing each one of those factors. But those items can be added to, to make them bespoke to that young person. And I'll describe that a bit more after the tea break. But I'm also saying it should always be cross-referenced. There has to be a constant set of cross-reference. And does this has happened here, but does that make sense over in this domain? And how does that affect the rest of that graph? So a continual analysis of the young person. Obviously, you're scoring it. You get those scores together to get a domain score and you get your profile graph and then your analysis of that and you're developing your initial, you know, your initial sort of intervention plans. The scoring sheets um, have in themselves also been developed with this bit of making sure, uh, and I know for a lot of people, whenever they were completing, whether that was in two or indeed any other risk assessments, is that you might have 20, 25 page plus um, assessment, and it comes down then to four or five sort of recommendations. But often what I find gets lost is the specifics of some of the things you've identified throughout the report. And the idea of this is that what I'm saying is that each factor in itself needs to be discussed, but that each domain, I want to make sure that you ask, what is your over analysis of each domain, the strengths and concerns, but also what are the intervention you're recommending for each domain so that no domain gets more attention than any other domain. So it forces us, I feel, as practitioners to make sure we consider that developmental the bespokeness of it, the individualized nature of it to make sure that that young person in terms of really thinking about what works well for them and making sure we don't lose sight of only focusing on what is the risk, but also look in terms of the other areas in that young person's life where they may need intervention. And that's what leads then to the development of a profile graph of the young person, which should change up and down, up and down with every intervention that you're doing. That's a very quick summary of what the M3 model is, but it has been driven by a need to individualize assessment processes of young people. It has been driven by a need for me to be able to have an assessment model that is easily understood by a young person and their family 
and that they could also score themselves within this and that they would understand it, but that the day can also see dynamic movement within it and that therefore that within that gives that sense of hope, but a sense of engagement. And it's really important within that. But it also brings within it the importance of let's see how all of these other areas affect that overall sense. Okay. I think I've now hit uh, sort of almost 10 o'clock. We're, we're going to have um, a coffee break. Um, and I think uh, 15 minutes, I think we've allowed for it, Malcolm. Yeah, I think between 10 and 15 minutes is fine. Um, however long you need. And, okay, and well. Remind people, because a lot of people have been asking the same question. Um, we will be providing uh, a copy of the notes and also giving you access to a, a video record of this um, presentation um, in it will take us a few days to um, put it together, but uh, it will be made available. So um, I think 10, 15 minutes. I'm happy to come back. Shall we say if we come back, say it about, um, yeah, at, at, uh, I think 10 minutes would be OK. Is that all right, everybody? Because we missed a couple of minutes. So let's come back about 10 past 10 uh, and I'll see you then. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you.